Good afternoon. Welcome to another A Push video with Mr. Pate for Barlow High School. Today we're going to be looking at the Federalist era foreign policy and the beginning of parties. All right, the essential question we have for today how did foreign policy situations contribute to the formation of the Federalist and Democrat Republican parties? Okay, and we'd better define some terms really quickly. Federalists. The Federalists are going to be Hamilton is going to be their leader. They are pro British. They are going to be interested in making a stronger, more centralized, more powerful government than maybe what was the interest of the Democrat Republicans. They see a stronger government is necessary and they fear kind of mob rule. The Democrat Republicans, on the other hand, are going to be led by Thomas Jefferson. They're going to favor the French after the French Revolution because they favor the triumph of the common man more so. They distrust a stronger centralized government and see it as leading more likely to tyranny. We will learn more about these groups as we go on, uh, but here we go. Okay, number one is the French Revolution. So France, okay, over here, clear on the edge of the board, France is going to be a, a country that has the first, the first revolution that overthrows a monarch for the whole country. I mean, the American colonies revolutionized, but it wasn't the mother country having the revolution. France is going to have that. And they're also going to be the first country to execute their monarch. And then they're going to have, the, within the revolution, they're going to kill a lot of the people who are the church leaders, the aristocracy and nobles, rich families. And basically it's kind of a bloodletting of all the powerful people in France. All of the neighboring countries in Europe are going to look at that and say, this is a terrible thing. We don't want this. We need to have, we need to get rid of this. So basically the vast majority of Europe itself is going to join an attack on France with the idea that they're going to restore a monarch. Now, of course, the king, Louis, is going to, the 16th is going to be killed. But after Louis is gone, and Marie Antoinette, there's an idea that they would restore, you know, an heir of theirs to become the new monarch, find someone else who's deserving and get him in there. Well, here's the interesting thing. The French are going to do something very clever. Similar to how the Soviets called everyone comrade, the French are going to say everyone is a citizen. So everyone is citizen this or citizen that. Okay? I would be citizen Page instead of Mr. Page or whatever. Well, the French then basically saying everyone's a citizen, we're all in this together, we are all working toward the same goal. They're going to then draft several hundred thousand young able-bodied men into their army and they kind of luck into having a great military general in Napoleon Bonaparte. So they create this massive army and similar to the American Revolution, this army within the French Revolution, the French, they're fighting for a cause. If you were a peasant, now you're a citizen. And now you're fighting for your freedom and a better way of life, you think. So they fight hard and passionately. They're very committed to their cause. Well, lo and behold, it's an interesting thing. You would think that France, you would have everybody gang up and beat them because it's just one country against most of Europe. They're going to dominate everybody under Napoleon's leadership. And basically, by the time Napoleon later on becomes kind of the emperor, they're going to take over basically Europe and have kind of an empire form for a short period of time. This is the French Revolution. Now, one of the things that's going to happen with the French Revolution is you have the initial revolution, and they arrest the king. Then you have a more hardcore group that takes over. They execute the king and other people, and you end up with something called the Reign of Terror. And you have these successive revolutions, and the new revolutionaries say the old revolutionaries are now like bloodthirsty with power, and they get rid of them. And so you have all these waves of people being executed. And when I say being executed, I mean we're talking guillotine, executions, chopping people's heads off in the public square of cities, and everyone goes out at lunchtime and watches these executions. Pretty, pretty bloody disgusting. This is going to horrify the Federalists. The people who are saying, we want to be an industrial power, we want a strong centralized government that's strong enough to create order in our society, that's not good. This is the triumph of the mobocracy, and they're saying, hey, we could, this could get away from us. We could have, you know, similar problems here. The French on the other, uh, the pro-French group, the Jeffersonian Democrat Republicans, they're going to look at this and say, okay, so they've had some excesses here, but we need to support them. As opposed to a king, a monarchy in, in Britain, this, these are our revolutionary brothers, 
and they are trying to establish a republic like ours. So that's the French Revolution. Now Washington is going to come out, and there is something that had been in place ever since Saratoga, the Battle of Saratoga, the American Revolution. You heard about that in the last video. What the alliance? The alliance. The French became the allies of the United States, and that alliance did not disappear in peacetime. It was still around. So the French don't formally come out and request or demand the U.S. to help them, but they're kind of expecting it. So Washington is going to look at this and say, all of Europe is raging against, our, it's against each other. We are in debt. We don't have any money. We don't have a big army. We need to not get involved in this. And so he says, we're going to have a neutrality proclamation. He basically says, we're not helping anybody. We're out of this war. Uh, it's not anything to do with us. So this kind of angers the French. And, you know, there are going to be several different things the French do. One of them is the Genet Affair. And the Genet Affair is going to be uh, this guy's citizen Genet. He's going to come over, and he's going to try and circumvent Washington and Congress, who are, you know, resolutely against getting involved in this. You know, most Democrat Republicans even thought getting involved in the actual war was a bad idea. But they thought maybe give them some aid or something. The Federalists are saying if you give them some aid, the British will think we're wrong against them, and then they'll attack us, and that's no good, or they'll punish us. The Genet Affair, a citizen Genet comes over, he appeals to some members of Congress, to businessmen, to the public as a whole, trying to get them to sway the U.S. government to get involved in the war. So this is kind of a manipulative way. Washington doesn't like it. He's going to ask that the French recall Genet and replace him with a different foreign minister and say, get out of our country. However, a revolution happens. Remember I said the previous groups kept getting, then they would be persecuted by the new group that took over. The new group says, oh yeah, send Genet back over here. We'll take care of him and execute him. Genet decides to settle and become an American citizen after that so he doesn't get killed. Okay, so that's the end of the Genet Affair. So it's kind of a manipulative attempt of the French to get U.S. involvement. Impressment. Okay, going back, there were some terms. The United States was supposed to be granted some fishing areas up near uh, Newfoundland. The British were supposed to evacuate some territories and forts down in the Ohio River Valley and get out of there and not encourage the Native Americans up in that area. But they still are. They're still trying to stymie U.S. westward advancement and they haven't left any of the forts. Now on the other side, the United States is going to have failed on a couple of their things in the Treaty of Paris. They were supposed to compensate loyalists for land they lost when they fled the country facing some persecution during the war. And they were also supposed to settle some pre-war debts they had with the British government, which they are basically reneging on both of those things. So both sides have things that are hanging out there. The British, they are also facing a situation where the British Navy, the Gray's Navy, controlling large parts of the Atlantic, the, the British Navy has a lot of deserters, and a lot of these deserters think becoming an American and getting some more rights and joining the Merchant Marine of America is a much better idea than being in the Royal Navy. So they're going to leave, and some of them desert to different countries, but a lot of them come to the United States. And again, the United States does not encourage this. This is just individuals making this choice. But the British are going to institute a policy called impressment. And this means they will have their ships go out anywhere they encounter them, stop U.S. ships, with, you know, basically their guns aimed at them, and they will go and search the ships looking for anyone they consider a British deserter. Now, they will find some British deserters, and they will reclaim them. But they're also going to just basically kidnap uh, and take away uh, large amounts of Americans as well. Could you imagine what would happen as an uproar today if you had someone who was on, like, an oil freighter, and they were kidnapped and forced into the Navy of Russia or China or something like that. The outrage would be massive. And that'd be if it was one person that happened. They would, the Today Show would be showing the wife and the children and the parents and everybody, all the friends and family of this sailor who had been basically forced into a foreign Navy. Well, you could see how this would make Americans mad, but this is happening many, many times, hundreds of times maybe thousands of times. Impressment is a big issue. So, when this is going on, Americans get ticked off about that. And this is going to ultimately lead to Jay's Treaty. And Jay's Treaty is very significant, not for what it says, but the reaction to it. And we see this often in history. 
Jay's Treaty, trying to deal with the issue of impressment and these other issues that are out there on both sides, it did not end impressment. What it does get is a still hollow promise by the United States that you know that uh, that the British will get their uh, they'll surrender these forts in the West and quit influencing the Indians out in the West, and the United States pledges that they'll pay off the debts and the money owed to the loyalists, and it doesn't really do much to solve the biggest problem, which is the impressment. So no one the British don't even claim an offer of this. Well, this makes the Jeffersonians furious, and is the direct item that leads to the forming of the Democrat Republicans as an opposing party, and we have the first party system is created by this, having two parties as opposed to each other. The first party system, Democrats, Republicans, come about because of Jay's treaty. They are angry because they say that, hey, the Federalists are taking it easy on the British because they want to cozy up to them and be their friends. This is, this is unfair and bad. So we get the forming of the Democrat Republicans, doesn't really solve anything. Jay's treaty really angers uh, a big portion of the country. So Washington is going to come out when he's leaving office with his farewell address. In it, he says, let's not be in any peacetime alliances. Now, this is directly looking back at the problems that have just happened with the French and the problems that will continue to be happening. Because by the time that Washington leaves, you have something that's going on called the Quasi-War. The Quasi-War means you have down in the Caribbean off the eastern seaboard of the United States, even over west of Europe, you have fighting all throughout the Atlantic between the U.S. and the French, where they're firing on each other, and it's a kind of an undeclared naval war. It's called the Quasi-War. So this is going on. So things are bad for the United States with foreign policy. You have British impressment going on. The, the French are basically attacking and you know, you're having all these violent things going on. P countries are on kind of the verge of war. Everyone's antagonistic. So Washington's farewell address says two things. One, avoid factions, which means do political parties. He sees this coming around and says this is going to be unhealthy. The Founding Fathers didn't think you would need to have political parties. He says don't have that. The second thing he's going to say is avoid peacetime alliances because he looks and sees how this problem with the French has developed. Okay, so we've talked about the quasi-war, this kind of undeclared naval war. To try and solve it, you have the XYZ affair. And what's going to happen with the XYZ affair is, essentially, you have um, within, well, you have the U.S. send over diplomats, and they try and meet with the French foreign minister, Talleyrand. But his envoys, his uh, subordinates who meet the American diplomats, they demand a bribe to meet him. Okay, now this was kind of customary practice in Europe, but this really stunk in, in the minds of the Americans thinking, you know, this is an outrage. They want us to pay them a bribe like we're some little chump country just to even get to talk to them about creating peace. And so, you know, you start having sayings like millions for defense, not a penny for tribute. Okay, and all of these, you know, these people are saying all these things kind of mad about we're not going to pay one bribe. Okay. Um, so you get the quasi-war kind of reinvigorates and flames up again. And then John Adams is going to do something called the Convention of 1818. And it's a very courageous thing. It's the greatest moment of the Adams presidency. It's his legacy. Uh, he basically goes against many people in his party who want war with the French. After the XYZ affair with the quasi-war going on, the, the, the Federalists are screaming to go to war with the French. Democrat Republicans are mad, but they're not wanting to go to war. Adams is going to realize that to go to war, the United States is just not equipped to do it, and it will have bad long-term impacts. He tries to go with the friends of all, enemies of none type of approach. The Convention of 1818 basically agrees to dissolve the alliance between the U.S. and France and to restore kind of peace and to make all things good that are bad. And it, it's just simply trying to, um, to mend the fences, I guess you could say. Why is this significant? The number one reason this is significant is the Louisiana Purchase. Because the borders are, because, uh, excuse me, the, the relationship is repaired and France and the United States are on good terms, when Napoleon comes into power, he's going to be willing to sell the United States, the Louisiana Territory, doubling the size of the United States. If the United States had had an antagonistic relationship or had just gone to war with France, do you think he would have sold United States' land. No way. 
So that's the overall significance. The Federalist era foreign policy problems with the British and the French lead to the formation of parties. That's all the time we have for today. Stay classy, Sam Barlow.